Good afternoon. I am very sorry not to be with you and to address you in such an anti-interactive manner, and I apologise for the slightly noisy background. To use an old metaphor, we can think of a glass as half empty or half full. I would like to offer here some ways of considering what we take to be difficult or wrong so that we create advantage in it. These considerations come from cybernetics, often defined as the study of control and communication in the animal and the machine, and especially from our current preoccupation with control. I always hope that the considerations I offer give us new options. It is probably fair to say that normally we take error as something to eliminate. Usually there is a feeling of wrongness and failure rather than opportunity, as if errors should not exist. We are punished for making mistakes. Every act of measurement we make forces what we measure into its grid, inevitably causing distortion. Every description of some thing is not, and must not be, that thing. Every explanation is a simplification. Each of these creates what we call error. The first subject to recognize and accept error as endemic, that is, naturally ever-present, was cybernetics. The need for control is generated by error. Feedback gives us the ability to continuously handle continuous error. Accepting error as endemic allows us to reduce our sense of guilt when we make a mistake. It allows us to reconceive error so that it can be seen as positive. This position is well known in design and the arts, where mistakes often lead to novelty. Vasily Kandinsky invented abstract art when he failed to recognize a painting of his own that had been stacked upside down in error. He saw a painting without an external reference, not telling some familiar story or representing a familiar scene. Associated with error are side effects. These might be thought of as errors that are slow to appear, thus seeming separate from the system of which they are side effects. Errors, being unintended even if endemic, can be seen as side effects that arise quickly and are usually considered more straightforward than what we call side effects. But if side effects and error are essentially the same, then side effects are also endemic and reconceivable. I propose, I propose that before we aim to get rid of error, we consider whether that error offers us new insight that might be to our advantage. Kandinsky saw the upside-down picture as offering a new possibility for what art might be. He created benefit from his error. I do not claim all error and side effects should be reconceived as valuable. I don't wish my plane to crash any more than you wish yours to. But since the possibility of error and side effects is omnipresent, let's try to benefit from it. Some situations inevitably lead to error. One such is logic's paradoxical vicious circle I'm sure we're all familiar with, such as the statement, all Cretans are liars, coupled to, I am a Cretan. We may not be so aware of the class undecidable questions and propositions that may lead to more than one response without there being any possible logical reason for choosing between them, leaving us to invoke some extra, usually personal, criteria. Here are three examples. Where does feedback go? This concerns asking questions relating to linear answers in a circular organisation. Am I part of, or apart from, the universe? This question concerns the relationship of the observer to the posited mind-independent reality of, for instance, much classical physics. And, is this glass half full or half empty? Recently we have tried to push undecidable questions and propositions into a corner where they can be treated as if logically determinable. But this is to force a distortion on them. So to make a decision about such a situation, we look outside the frame of reference. Thus, 
Feedback goes nowhere. But if we invoke energy, we can say feedback is sent from a controlled system to the one controlling it. Defining the roles of controller, low energy use, and controlled, high energy use, through energetics. However, in a world of messages, this is not so, and we get the notion of circularity of control, which lies mutualistically between the two elements. Similarly, I can decide in favour of a mind-independent reality and treat my world as objective, or I can decide against when I accept the responsibility of the subjective. As for my glass, whether I see it as half empty or half full is my choice, and I'm responsible for my consequent mood, whether positive or negative. The point about undecidable questions and propositions is that we're involved in shaping the conditions and we make the decision. Some fear this, for it means there is no system to relieve us of responsibility. Others delight in the freedom given to us to think for ourselves and accept the consequent responsibility, the lack of acceptance of which I believe is the source of many of our societal problems. Certain problems cannot be solved, for instance, wicked problems. Announced in 1973 by design theorist Horst Rittel with Martin Weber, he and reformulated in a simpler expression by Jeff Conklin in 2006. Characteristics include that they are often underspecified, contain contradictions between various aspects of their specification, are unmanageably messy and complicated. In general, you don't know what problem you've been solving until you have the solution which defines the problem, in contrast to our traditional expectation. Rittle first talked of these problems occurring in planning, but it has since become clear that they are not restricted to any one discipline. All problems that require a truly novel solution are of this sort, as are design problems. Let me talk briefly about design, which gives us, amongst other things, a way of handling wicked problems. The word design is used in different ways. I cannot properly elaborate here. Examples include as an activity, verb, as an outcome, noun, as styling, and as a way of thinking that results in new outcomes. My understanding reflects my background as a designer rather than a design engineer. In the sense I use design, it is, at heart, a way of acting involving a sort of circular process of utterance, usually making marks on paper, and reception, usually looking at these marks. Because of differences between how we make and view, we do not see exactly what we thought we drew, so there is a sort of idea creep that takes us from where we started into new places, often giving rise to novelty. This process does not deny or reject other approaches, which, for example, deal with function. But, working in conjunction with them, it is what distinguishes designing from problem-solving. The activity of designing is essentially cybernetic and commonly satisfies the criterion good enough rather than best. Good enough turns out to be better than best for several reasons, including because it leaves us with the opportunity to improve and keep on improving. In a sense, it's a job creation program, always leaving us the possibility of having another go and doing better. From the point of view of our use of human resources, this is a better way forward than achieving a final solution. Design, however, offers more than this. It gives us diversity of approach. We are not tied down to one way of thinking and acting, with the dangers we all know when there is only one path open to us. I have presented three concepts normally seen as problematic as we go about making our world more tidy and efficient. The trouble with efficiency is that when anything goes wrong, it often becomes ineffective, reminding us of Stafford Beer's definition of cybernetics as the science of effective action. Each of the concepts I have introduced is associated with difficulty and failure. 
And while we all know failures and imperfections which are damaging, leaving us out of control in our relation to our world, many failures and imperfections can be used for the positive, as sources of learning and the sort of novelty that reaches beyond the already imagined. Next year marks the 50th anniversary of the death of Norbert Wiener, who named modern cybernetics and gave the characterization I offered at the outset, and the 50th anniversary of the founding of the American Society for Cybernetics here in Washington, D.C. The ideas I have presented come from cybernetics, sometimes even the cybernetics of rejected control. Perhaps, if you find them interesting, to have potential, you would like to join us celebrating this way of thinking, to share our half-full glasses,